This is the Linear Algebra Lectures video series. You can find more information about this video as well as a link to the written textbook in the description below. Stick around to the end of the video to learn more about this video series and the associated teaching and learning tools I've created for it. Lecture 21, Matrix Operations. Our objectives for this lecture are to understand how to add two matrices and multiply a matrix by a scalar, multiply two matrices when that operation is defined, and use the row column rule and or technology to multiply two matrices. First, we're going to establish some notation for the entries of a matrix. So when we have a matrix A, we're going to write A subscript IJ or A subscript I comma J for the entry that's in row I and column J. And the entries where the two subscripts are the same, the entries that look like A subscript II, those form the main diagonal of A. So that's A sub 1, 1, A sub 2, 2, A sub 3, 3, and so on. Now, we'll usually omit the comma unless doing so would be ambiguous. So for example, if I write a subscript 113, do I mean row 1, column 13, or do I mean row 11, column 3? So in that situation, we would want to use a comma. We would either write a subscript 1, comma 13, or a subscript 11, comma 3, whichever one we actually meant when we wrote that notation. Now the n by n identity matrix, which we write capital I subscript n, is the square matrix whose main diagonal entries are 1 and whose other entries are 0. So I1 is just the 1 by 1 matrix that contains a 1. I2 is the 2 by 2 matrix that looks like 1, 0, 0, 1. I3 is the 3 by 3 identity matrix, and so on. In this matrix, we've seen it before, this has the property that if you multiply this identity matrix by any vector, you just get that vector back. So I sub n times x is just equal to x. And we usually just write i if the size of the matrix is clear from context. So if we know what size matrix we're talking about, we'll typically just write i rather than i sub n. Now the zero matrix, which we'll usually write as capital O, is the matrix that has all zero entries. And the size of the matrix should be clear from context. So again, in any given situation, if we write capital O, the size of the matrix that we're talking about should be clear from the other matrices in the problem. Now we've got three different kinds of zero things that we have to understand that we have different notations for. We've got the regular old number zero, the zero scalar, which we just write as the numeral zero. And now we've got boldface zero, which represents the zero vector. And now we have capital letter O, which represents the zero matrix. So be careful when you're looking at these notations and make sure you know whether you're looking at a numeral, a boldface numeral, which represents a vector, or a capital letter O, which represents that zero matrix. Now, if we want to add two matrices, the two matrices have to have the same size, and we just add corresponding entries of those matrices. So the I comma J entry, the row I column J entry of A plus B, is A sub IJ plus B sub IJ. So for example, here we have two two by three matrices, and if we want to add them together, the way that we do that is we just take the corresponding entries and add them together. So in the upper left of A, we have a two, in the upper left of B, we have a one, so the upper left of A plus B is two plus one, which is three. So we do the same with the other two matrices, adding them together to get the sum. If we want to multiply a matrix by a scalar, we multiply each entry of that matrix by that scalar. So the I comma J entry of CA is C times A sub IJ. So for example, if we want to take this matrix A and multiply it by three, we simply multiply each entry by three to get the result here. So these two operations have some nice algebraic properties like the other operations that we've studied earlier in this course. We have commutativity, associativity, and so on. So these will be properties that tell us that we can use our algebraic intuition when we're dealing with either adding matrices or multiplying matrices by scalars. But multiplying a matrix by another matrix is defined in a more complicated way, but a way that turns out to be very useful. And the way that we define the multiplication of two matrices is by thinking about the corresponding transformations. So let's say that we have two transformations, s of x equals ax and t of x equals bx. Assuming the domains and the codomains of these transformations match up in the right way, we can compose these transformations, creating s composed with t, which just has the formula that s composed with t of x is s of t of x. Now keep in mind when we write this, we're doing t first, right? t of x is inside those parentheses, so we apply the transformation t to the vector x first, and then apply s second. So s composed with t is s of t of x, and this does turn out to be a linear transformation, again, when it's defined. And since every linear transformation has a corresponding standard matrix, we can think about the standard matrix of this composed transformation, s composed with t, and that's what we're going to define a times b to be. So given two matrices a and b, we define a b to be the standard matrix of the composition of the corresponding transformations. 
So that means that s composed with t of x is ab times x. But s composed with t of x is also s of t of x, which would be a times b times x. And so this means that our product a times b has to be defined so that those two things are the same. So that a times b times x is the same as a times b times x. And that's the key for us to understand how to actually multiply two matrices together. The way that we find the standard matrix of a transformation is we evaluate that transformation at the standard basis vectors e sub i. So what's the ith column of ab? Well, it's s composed with t of e sub i. Let's walk through the derivation here. So s composed with t of e sub i is s of t of e sub i. That's just the definition of composition. And since b is the standard matrix for t, t of ei is b times ei. But whenever we multiply a matrix by one of those standard basis vectors, we just get that column of that matrix. So b times ei is just the ith column of b, which I'll write lowercase b sub i. And then a is the standard matrix for s, so s of bi is a times bi. So this tells us that the columns of the matrix ab, the product matrix, look like the vectors a times bi, where bi is the ith column of the matrix b. Now for this to be defined, the number of entries in each of those columns b sub i, which is the same as the number of rows of b, has to equal the number of columns of a. Remember that to multiply a matrix by a vector, the number of entries in that vector has to equal the number of columns of the matrix you're multiplying by it. So that means in order for a times b to be defined, the number of columns of a has to match the number of rows of b. Otherwise, it's just not defined. The other thing to keep in mind is that when we multiply a times b, that product matrix might be a different size than either a or b. For this to work, a has to be an m by n matrix, and b has to be an n by p matrix, where again, that second dimension of a, the number of columns of a, has to match the first dimension of b, the number of rows of b. And then the number of rows of a times b, that's m, that was the number of rows of a. And the number of columns of a times b, that's p, that was the number of columns of b. All right, we've talked about this a bunch, let's work through some examples. So let's say that we have two matrices here, a is a two by two matrix and b is a two by three matrix, and we wanna multiply a times b. And then we'll think about how we would compute b times a. But let's start with computing a times b. So the first thing we have to check is whether this is even defined. So we have to check the number of columns of the first matrix. So a is two by two, so a has two columns. And the number of rows of the second matrix, b is two by three, so b has two rows. And those numbers match, so that means that we can, in fact, multiply a times b here. And the columns of a times b are what we get when we multiply the first matrix times the columns of the second matrix. b has three columns, so ab will also have three columns. And those three columns are a times b1, a times b2, and a times b3. So we compute a times each individual column of b, and those become the columns of a times b. So we collect those three products together into a matrix in that same order, and we get a times b is the two by three matrix that you see here. And if you need a refresher for how to multiply a matrix by a vector, remember that we learned that back in lecture nine. All right, now let's think about what b times a is. So again, for the product of two matrices to be defined, the number of columns of the first matrix has to match the number of rows of the second matrix. In this order, b is the first matrix, and b has three columns, and a is the second matrix, and a has two rows. But three and two are different numbers, those don't match, and so that means that this product b times a is undefined. Let's take a look at another example here. So we've got two matrices b and c, and we want to multiply them together. So let's see what we get. First of all, we need to make sure that that product is defined. So we check the number of columns of the first matrix and match it up with the number of rows of the second matrix. Those numbers are both three here, those match, so that means that this product is defined. C has two columns, which means that BC will also have two columns, and those two columns are going to be B times C1 and B times C2. We multiply B times those two columns of C separately, and the two products that we get become the two columns of B times C. Now, what if we try to multiply these matrices in the other order? What's c times b? Well, again, before we do any calculations, before we do anything else, let's first make sure that that product is defined. We check the number of columns of the first matrix and match it up with the number of rows of the second matrix. The first matrix, c, has two columns, and the second matrix, b, has two rows, 
those two numbers match, and so that means that this product is also defined. B, the second matrix, has three columns, so CB will also have three columns, and those three columns are C multiplied by each individual column of the matrix B. We work all that out, we get three products, those become the three columns of CB, and so this product is defined in the other order as well. Now a shortcut we can use here to make this calculation easier is called the row column rule. And this is related to the row vector rule that we learned back in lecture nine. So when A is an M by N matrix and B is an N by P matrix, the entry that's in row I and column J of AB is the sum of the products of the corresponding entries of the ith row of A and the jth column of B. This sounds kind of complicated, but all this means is that we go across the ith row of A and down the jth column of B and we multiply and add, and the result of all that is the i comma j entry of the product AB. So this is helpful to know because sometimes we just want one single entry of the product matrix, not the whole product matrix. So let's see this row column rule in action, computing the product A times B here. And again, before we go any further, let's make sure that this product is actually defined. We check the number of columns of the first matrix and the number of rows of the second matrix. A is two by three, B is three by three, we check those inside numbers and make sure that they match. And then the outside numbers tell us the size of the resulting product matrix. So AB is going to end up being two by three. So let's draw a little template here, a little two by three template, and let's think about how we can use the row column rule to understand how to compute each individual entry of this product. So for example, let's say that we wanted to know what entry is in row one, column two of A times B. Well, the row column rule tells us to look at the entries in row one of the first matrix and column two of the second matrix, and we multiply and add. So we take the corresponding entries of that row and that column. So we take the first entry of the row, which is negative two, multiplied by the first entry of the column, that's negative three. We take the second entry times the second entry and the third entry times the third entry, adding all that up gives us 14. So the row one, column two entry of AB is 14. Now, what if we wanted the row two, column three entry of A times B? So we go across row two of the first matrix and column three of the second matrix, multiplying and adding. In this case, that gives us seven. So continuing in this way, we fill in the, all of the entries of A times B, and we get the product A times B here. This turns out to be the same calculations that we were doing before, but sometimes we'll just want one single entry of our product or just a handful of entries in our product, and so this way will save us some time. Now for using technology, you can multiply matrices on your calculator simply by using the multiplication symbol. But if we're using Wolfram, we need to be a little bit more careful. If we just write A star B, if A and B are matrices in Wolfram, what that's going to do is it's actually gonna just multiply the corresponding entries by each other, which is not gonna be what we want. So in Wolfram, we need to use the period symbol, so A dot B here, to actually multiply using the method that we've learned in this lecture. So if you're using Wolfram, just be a little bit more careful with your notation. Thanks for watching this video lecture. You can find links to the other videos in this series and to the written textbook in the description below. If you're an instructor, you can contact me for more information about the over 300 online linear algebra homework problems that I've created for the free MyOpenMath platform.